Well, good evening, everyone. It's very good to be before you uh, once again. Uh, Sarah is well. She's just healing, and uh, certainly the uh, little baby Keziah is, is healing, and she's, she's good, and the family's good, and we're certainly thankful for the prayers, and, and all of you looking out for us. We've received a few meals as well that uh, my, my young ones have appreciated because it's kind of dangerous when I start cooking, <laughs> probably for the whole family, but... Uh, but certainly thankful for all, all the love and uh, well wishes and certainly prayers. We're certainly thankful for all of that. Uh, the book of the month we selected uh, was Second Peter. And I've been trying to, in the Sunday evening, selecting a book of the month, and we'll probably bounce back to the Old Testament next month. But we are in Second Peter, if you'd like to turn your Bibles over there. The first lesson that we looked at in Second Peter, we were looking at the idea of true knowledge. And perhaps that's not the best uh, phrasing, but I think that's really what Peter is trying to hit in chapter 1 of Second Peter. Second Peter, very short epistle, three chapters, and it really is packed and it's really addressing uh, false teaching. But if you notice, for chapter 1 really hits at, you know, well, how could we possibly combat false teaching? And Peter's like, look at the scriptures. That's really what chapter 1 is all about. uh, Peter is really trying to address false teaching that's popping up within the church and also outside the church as well, trying to address false teaching. And it's amazing when you go through these letters that even though, uh, you know, I just want to try to preach the truth, is as you go through these letters, it's amazing that there are common trends. And one of the common trends is there are false teachers out there. And it really is quite amazing because when we go out to the religious world, it's almost like we hear the opposite. There is almost no false teaching. You're okay, I'm okay, you know, we're, we're taking different paths, but we're all going to the same place. We start hearing those types of things, but if we're teaching the exact opposite, if we're teaching totally different things, it would seem that we could not be on the same path. And I think that's what Peter's trying to say, is that there are some people that are not on the right path. There is false teaching that's out there. And in chapter 1, he really starts laying down a powerful message, I think, towards the Gnostics, which was a a group during that time uh, of really false teachers. But these individuals felt like there was a higher knowledge above the Bible. And this would lead them to different things. It would lead them into different theories. It would really lead them away from the truth. And Peter, I think he is really trying to address this majorly in chapter 1. I think of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. I have the ESV this evening. It says, May the grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God uh, uh, our Lord Jesus. Verse 3, His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. See, he is hitting some of this, this false teaching right in the first few verses. He's saying, you want to have true knowledge? You want to be a follower of God? All of it is right here. The truth is accessible to all. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But these people are saying, well, we don't quite have everything. Or we would like to enlighten you about something else that would actually lead people away. We've got more knowledge than the Bible has. And Peter says that simply is not so. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And then I think he really is going after these false teachers. Not only is he trying to encourage Christians to have good character and seek the truth within the scriptures, but he's also combating false teaching at the same time. He says all answers are right here in the Bible. As he continues on in chapter 1, he says you really want to show that you're enlightened? You really want to show that you have true knowledge? You want to show that you're a Christian? Grow. And he addresses that in chapter 1. He says grow, and he lists off a whole bunch of qualities there in chapter 1. We see the idea of growing and virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness, godliness. And he just rattles off a big long list. You want to say you're a Christian. You want to say you have true knowledge. You want to say you're enlightened? Grow. And many of those false teachers were not growing. They didn't want to grow in self-control. They didn't want to grow in knowledge. They didn't want to be steadfast. They didn't want to love their brothers the way that they should. They just wanted to be superior to their brothers. They wanted to be able to look down on their brothers. And many of these individuals were Christians. And I think we can see that throughout the book. I think you see it in verse 2. And I think you also see it as the book unfolds. We see the idea that Peter is writing to Christians and there's some false teaching within the church and also uh, outside of the church as well. You want to have true knowledge, there's only one place you can go. It's to the scriptures. 
the scriptures that have all things that pertain to life and godliness. You want to be a, a Christian, you need to grow. You need to serve. In chapter 2, Peter gets very direct. He gets very direct and starts talking about false teachers and looking at false teaching very directly. In chapter 1, I think he was saying, you know what, look to the scriptures, that's where our answers are. Chapter 2, he says a lot of people are going to try to get you away from the scriptures. There are a lot of false teachers out there. Let's look at what the Bible says, what Peter is saying about false prophets. Let's look, look, look at verses 1 through 3 in chapter 2. It says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their uh, sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. You know, Peter, I don't know if he can lay it out any more plain, is there's going to be false teachers out there in the world. And there's going to be false teachers even within the church itself. The world is riddled with false teachers. When we look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it talks about the narrow way and it talks about the broad way which leads to destruction. In order for that to be true, we would come, I think, to the reasonable conclusion there's going to be a lot more falsehood out there than there is going to be the truth. And there's going to be some diligence. There's going to have to be some caution. There's going to have to be some study to make sure that we are staying on that straight and narrow path. And really, Second Peter, I don't know how you can't go through it and not see that Peter's saying be very careful because a lot of people are saying you need more than the Bible. There's a lot of people saying you need less than the Bible. There's a lot of people trying to get you as far away from God's Word as they can. Be very careful. These false teachers are going to be among you. These false teachers are going to be all around. Sometimes uh, when we think about false teachers, there's a lot of this that happens, that happens intentionally, and then there's perhaps some that happens unintentionally, but when it happens unintentionally, a lot of times it's out of ignorance. And ignorance is not an excuse. And although many people would like to use that today, I think of Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. This time of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. God, I believe, I think God looks at man and says, you're without an excuse to come to a conclusion that there is a God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Since the creation of the world, your invisible attributes are clearly seen. Be understood by the things that are made. Even your eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. God knows that his creation can come to the conclusion that there's a God. And also, read God's word and come to a conclusion on what God wants us to do. But you've got to have a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, I think a lot of these false teachers that Second Peter, that Peter's talking about, a lot of them don't have a pure heart. They're not really trying to ask the question, what does the Bible say? What would God have me to do? Even if it's hard, even if it's challenging, even if it would put me up against adversity, even if it would not be the easiest path, would I do what God said even if it was hard? Even if it meant I'd have to walk away from certain things. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God's word needs to be rightly divided, and there's a lot of individuals that are trying to corrupt God's word and take it out of context and do all kinds of things with it. You have to rightly divide it. And there is a lot of dividing that needs to happen. There are some very basic divisions in the Bible that many of our neighbors miss. If you ask many of our neighbors in the denominational world, do we follow the Ten Commandments today, many would say yes. Well, if you follow the Ten Commandments today, wouldn't you follow the punishments as well? What's the punishment if you do not keep the Sabbath? Death. There should be people that are dying right now for not keeping the Sabbath. What about murder? What about adultery? What about all those Ten Commandments? See, we follow the New Testament and what Jesus has said. But see, a lot of people, they struggle with rightly dividing the word of truth. We are following the New Testament. We are following the words of Jesus. And yes, Jesus tells us not to murder. Yes, Jesus tells us not to commit adultery. In fact, Jesus even goes a step farther than that many times. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you've heard it said of old to not murder, but I tell you not to hate your brother. 
He says, you've heard it said of old, do not commit adultery. I tell you, do not even look on a woman and lust for her. Really, what Jesus is asking to do is actually more stringent than the Old Testament in many ways because the Old Testament was just saying, don't commit the outward act. And Jesus says, you better get your heart right. Because if you start looking at a woman and lusting for her, I know what it's going to lead to. It's going to lead to adultery. If you start hating individuals that are around you, I know what that leads to. Jesus says, you better go to work on your heart. So in a sense, we follow many of the Ten Commandments, but we follow the New Testament, whatever Jesus restated. But a lot of people want to carry the Old Testament, but they won't carry the punishments of the Old Testament. They're inconsistent. There are many things that we have to rightly divide. Understanding the difference between the Old and New Testament is just one of those. But God was very cautious and has always told his people to be very cautious to watch out for false teachers. Even if we go back to the Old Testament, there were tests for false teachers. If you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses is really repeating the law to the Israelites before they go into the promised land, he tells them, I have a couple tests for you to test false prophets. And we can find these in a variety of places, but one of those is Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 through 22. Now there, Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 through 22, he tells them, if there's a prophet out there that says something's going to happen, and they say they're speaking for God, and it doesn't happen, he says they're a false prophet. So one of the tests is to watch a false prophet, see what they say, and see what happens. That was a test that they used in the Old Testament. You know another test they had? In Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, it tells the Israelites, if God has told you something and somebody else comes along, and they tell you something else, go with what God says. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, it basically says, don't contradict the word of God. If God has told you something, why would you go and listen to a man who's telling you something different than what God said? You cannot contradict what God has said. He tells the Israelites this. He says, you're going to go into a land, and they're going to say, you know, God said this. Or someone else said this. Or a man said this. And he says, you better listen to what God said. And you know what? I think that's how many people get in trouble with false teachers. Is we run around and we look at what man has to say. We look at what the preacher has to say. But we don't take enough time to sit down and say, what did God say? And if God said it, we better go with that. If God said it, we better go with that. That's what he told the Israelites. Do we test false prophets the way that we should? Do we test people the way we should today? Peter says there's going to be false prophets. They're going to be among you. How can we test them? We can test them by seeing if they contradict what God has already said. Are there people out there that contradict what God has already said? In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're of God, because many false prophets have went out into the world. There's some testing that has to be done with a Christian, with somebody that's trying to find that straight and narrow path. If you want to find that straight and narrow path, you're going to have to say, is this what God said or is this not what God said? Is this what God said or is this not what God says? And that is the only way we can stay on that straight and narrow path, is looking and listening to the words of God, walking by faith and not by sight. Walking by faith. Well, what, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you're walking your spiritual journey, when you're walking your spiritual walk, when you're trying to walk the Christian life, you better be listening to the words of God. And there are going to be a lot of voices out there screaming this and that. It's not bad to test things. You know, I remember Paul, when he got kicked out of Thessalonica, in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, he got kicked out, he got ran out of town in Thessalonica, and the brethren sent him away because it was just getting so fiery in Thessalonica. They were concerned for his safety. And they sent him away. In Acts chapter 17, he's showing up at the next town. And in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, it says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. They're leaving Thessalonica. They send them away by night to Berea. It says, When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. It says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. These individuals were willing to test and make sure that what Paul was saying was matching up with the scriptures. When he was talking about Christ and the prophecies, which were surely in his conversations with them, 
They were saying, okay, this is what the Old Testament says. This is what Paul says. This is what happened with Jesus. Does it match up? They were willing to test. We have to be willing to test as well. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, it says, Test all things, hold fast to that which is good. Do you test on what the Bible says? Or do we test on our own opinions? Well, that feels right to me. I think that's right to me. That kind of feels like that would be right. Or do we try to look at what God has to say? We are so richly blessed. You know, so many of our young people, and maybe many of our old as well, many of us have the Bible on our phones. It is perhaps more accessible than it has ever been in human history. You know, on your lunch break, the Bible is more accessible than it has ever been. At your home, it's more accessible than it's ever been. When you're waiting in line at the DMV, it's more accessible than it's ever been. (laughs) It's right there. But how many times will we listen to the world more than we will the Bible? We'll listen to the news time and time again. We'll listen to the political commentary. But we won't open the words of the Bible and see what God has to say. God will tell you about the end of times. He'll tell you about it. God will tell you about what makes a good nation. God will tell you what makes a good family. God will tell you how to conduct yourself at the workplace, but the world is putting all kinds of things out there, and we have to be able to test it with the words of God. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified. If any man speak, let him speak the oracles of God. There are no words that are more worthy to be spoken. And it seems like it's the words that our world runs away from today. You want to know what we should do with the Lord's Supper? Read the book. You want to know how to worship God? Read the book. You want to know how to conduct yourself? Read the book. You were bought at a price. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. And what's interesting is when he starts talking about this, he talks about these individuals, and in verse, uh, verse 1, I believe there, he doesn't even get to verse 2, it says, who secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying their master who bought them. You know, I think that we are talking about, in many cases, we are talking about the church. Peter is writing to the church. And although there are people outside of the church that twist the scriptures, many times there are people within the church that twist the scriptures. In fact, in this very book, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible says this. It says, Also in all the epistles, speaking in them of of things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist their own destruction. You know people can twist the scriptures to their own destruction? False teachers, people within the church can twist the scriptures to their own destruction. Not everything in the Bible is hard to understand. But what's sad is we'll take things that are very simple in the Bible and we'll make them complicated. And we'll take things that are a little bit more challenging. And we will just twist those, twist those until we have some new and revolutionary thing that you cannot read about in the pages of the Bible. In fact, in chapter 3, you know what Peter talks about? He talks about the second coming of our Lord. And you know what? There was people that were preaching false doctrine back then about the second coming, and there's people preaching false doctrine in our day about the second coming. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, he talks about it. He said the Lord's coming back, and he starts laying out things, and people are saying things about the Lord coming back, and he just keeps addressing it in chapter 3. But there are many false teachings out there. They damage the church. They can certainly damage the people that are around us. And certainly it ends and eternal destruction. Look at what the expectation is for false teachers. Let's continue on. We read the first three verses, but look at verses 4 through 10. There is an expectation for false teachers. It says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah a uh, herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he uh, rescued righteous lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among 
them day after day. He was tormented. Uh, he was tormented, his righteous soul, over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Peter says at the beginning of chapter 2, there are false teachers. Some of these false teachers are going to be among you. What's the expectation for false teachers? Punishment. The expectation for false teachers is punishment. And I don't know if you could get any more powerful than Peter does. Peter gives three examples of perhaps people that you think God might give a pass to. You think God would give a pass to the angels if they slipped up? God did not give a pass to the angels that slipped up. You think God would give a pass to the whole world if the whole world went bad and there was just a few left that were righteous and good? Surely God would give the ancient world a pass. You know what? Surely God would give a couple cities, actually the Valley of Cities, but a couple cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, surely he would give them a pass just for being involved in sexual misconduct. God did not give these individuals passes. God did not give the angels a pass. He did not give the ancient world a pass. He did not give uh, these individuals in Sodom and Gomorrah a pass. They disobeyed God. They were lost and swept away by false doctrine and false teaching. And they were punished. And certainly we could talk about each of these in length. And certainly some people try to go to places. But can you just not take the point that's there? The point that there is the idea of will false teachers be able to escape punishment? Will false teachers be able to get away with this? And the answer is no. The angels didn't get away with it. The ancient world did not get away with it. Sodom and Gomorrah did not get away with it. And any false teacher will not get away with it. Judgment is coming. Are you ready for that day? Do not abandon the words of God. In 2 John chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, Whoever transgresseth and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. You think about that, 2 John chapter 1 and verse 9. He who transgresseth and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. If you don't have the teachings of God, you don't have God. And I think that's kind of a message that Peter's trying to get across, is these, these Gnostics are like, I'm so much better than everybody else. I'm so enlightened. I have more knowledge than the Bible. And you know what? I'm living a better life than you by not living the Christian life. They were trying to get around it any way they could. People try to do that today in a variety of ways. Paul struggled with it. Paul preached about grace. And what did people do with it? They took it as a license to sin. Grace is a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Paul preached it. He preached it well. You know what people tried to do? They tried to twist Paul's preaching on grace to say, we have a license to sin. And Paul has to confront him and say, no. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we who died to sin live any longer therein? They tried to twist Paul's teachings on grace. People try to twist all kinds of teachings in the Bible today. They will not escape judgment. Do you understand you will not escape judgment? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Are you ready for that day? You need your record wiped clean with the blood of Christ. And certainly we have to avoid false teaching. Because there is no escape. The expectation for the false teacher is punishment. In those verses that we just read, I do think that there is a little bit of hope there, even though it is really talking about the expectation of false teachers and their punishment. There's a little bit of hope. It talks about Noah, and it talks about Lot. And you think about Noah and Lot, they really had the deck stacked against them. Noah had the whole ancient world around him doing wickedness, and yet... Noah could still be faithful to God, surrounded by wickedness. And God delivered Noah, surrounded by a world of wickedness. And you know what? God did the same thing for Lot. You know, many times Lot gets a hard rap, but I tell you, when you read 2 Peter here, it's very interesting. It should get you to think about Lot a little bit deeper. It says that Lot was righteous, 
And Lot was vexed by the people around him. Now, I'm not saying Lot lived a perfect life, but right here when you read 2 Peter, maybe it changes some of your thoughts as we read some of the accounts of Lot. Lot was bothered by everything that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. I think it made him sick. I think it tormented him. I think maybe he made the mistake. Maybe he should have had his family out of there a little bit sooner. Because when he tried to leave, his wife wasn't quite ready. She had to look back. And God said, do not look back. But Lot was bothered by everything going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Are we still bothered by the world we live in? Are we bothered by sin? Are we bothered by abortion? Are we bothered by, by the civil unrest and disobedience to the government? Are we bothered by, by things going on in our society? It says that he was vexed. He was tormented. He did not like what was going on in the world around him. He did not like the falsehood that was around him. And although Lot certainly made some mistakes, he was trying to resist. And I believe he was delivered. I believe Noah was delivered. And that's something to think about, is that God can deliver us even when we're surrounded by so much evil. There are false teachers out there. The expectation for false teachers is the idea that they will come to judgment and let's continue, and let's just complete the end of the chapter, although there are many verses that we could uh, think about and consider. I'll pick up in verse 12. It says, But these, like ir irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing, they count it uh, pleasure to uh, revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reviling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam and the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing but was rebuked for his own transgression as a speechless donkey spoke with, uh, with a human voice and restrains the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and misdriven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely uh, who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, and the last state has become worse for them than the first, for it would have been better to have never known the way of righteousness than have, after known, knowing it, turned back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, having washing herself, returns to wallowing in the mire. Certainly there is a whole lot there in 2 Peter chapter 2. And as we look at, at kind of the wrapping up, is we see the depravity of these false teachers. These false teachers have got to a point where they're almost more like animals than they are individuals. And in Exodus, it actually talks about if an animal gets out and it actually kills someone or kills them, basically, that animal should be killed. These people are so violent, they're like animals. And they're killing individuals, and really, they, they perhaps don't realize it, but their sinful activities are not only dangerous for themselves, but they're also dangerous for the people that are around them. But these people are sick, and they're lost in sin. When it talks about adultery, it says their eyes are full of adultery. It's almost like the idea that every woman they look upon is theirs. It doesn't matter if they're married. It doesn't matter who they are. If they look upon a woman, that's theirs. And they have those lustful thoughts, and I believe that they pursue it. You really get this picture of just this depravity and, and this sinfulness that these individuals are lost in. They're greedy. I believe uh, they fall, uh, like it says, to Balaam. But really, when you look at verses 17 and following, it talks about their teaching, and their teaching is empty. And so many times, there's so much false teaching out there, it is empty, 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 and it's worthless. But when you get to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, 
there are so many people in the denominational world that preach once saved, always saved. And every time I read 2 Peter, it hits me over and over again. Peter is writing to Christians. And he talks about people that have escaped, and now these people are now entangled again. Well, how can you be entangled again if you never escaped in the first place? Really, when you read through 2 Peter, there are multiple occasions that could be drawn out where we see individuals that seem to be in a good condition, but then seem to fall into a very bad condition because of false teaching, because of getting away from the truth, and heeding the fables that are around them. Certainly so much more could be said, but 2 Peter chapter 2, it's warning you about false teaching. Will you listen to the words of God or will you listen to the words of men? We have to be very careful throughout our lives. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian this evening. Hear the word, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. We see that as the pattern in the New Testament. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. We'd love to help you in any way that we can if you come as we stand and as we sing.